Every now and then I come across statements from film analysis deniers claiming that movies have no meaning and are therefore basically perceptual blank canvases upon which we project our own meaning. In other instances, it's claimed that the only meanings that can be reliably attributed to a film are the meanings that are verbally admitted by the filmmakers. In fact, there are whole videos here on YouTube devoted to those two theories. Both of those views are wrong though for multiple reasons. Filmmakers often lie about the meanings of their films, or they admit that there are hidden meanings but they refuse to say what they are. I made a whole video on that subject. Or their filmmaking choices were based on subconscious urges and ideas that they don't know how to verbally explain, or they simply aren't consciously aware of why they did it. There are certainly arguments that can be made in favour or against competing interpretations of a given movie, but rather than talk about it all in generalistic terms, which is a bit boring, I decided to make a video on this subject about The Wizard of Oz specifically. I was watching this movie recently and it occurred to me that the psychological meanings of the film are, at least in part, very obvious to adult viewers. But if we adults tried to explain those psychological meanings to young children, those kids either wouldn't be able to consciously understand what was being explained to them about why they watch these movies and what they mean, or they wouldn't want to understand it at the conscious verbal level. They prefer to experience the film's psychological intricacies subconsciously and simply enjoy the surface level emotions that those deep processes invoke. Released in 1939, Wizard of Oz is now an 80 year old film, but it still has a big fan base and continues to appeal to children to this day. The fake looking sets and the old school filming and editing style haven't dampened its appeal and it still appeals to adults. Many a time I've had conversations with adult film fans who are sophisticated enough mentally to appreciate complex movies by the great auteurs, and yet they still say that Wizard of Oz is brilliant. How can a film so childish and so obviously disconnected from reality hold such wide appeal, and for over 80 years? Well, one thing that stands out to me is that the film quite obviously uses a double narrative plot structure. And which one of those plots you perceive tends to be based upon your age and thus your level of understanding of basic human psychology. The plot that young children experience is a fantastic adventure into a magical faraway land. In very young children's minds, young Dorothy's house is swept up in a hurricane and dropped into this faraway colourful land and after meeting new friends and escaping the clutches of a witch, she and her home are returned to their original setting via the magic of her red shoes. For young kids, this stuff literally happens in the story and is therefore just as real as Dorothy's colourless scenes on the farm at the beginning of the movie. For these very young viewers, the bizarre characters and locations of Oz are real, the witch's threats are real and scary, and the magic is real. But for older kids who have learned a bit more about how their own minds work, and for adults, the surrealist journey is very obviously a huge dream sequence. The personal worries, desires and relationships of Dorothy's waking life are played out psychologically in the form of an extended dream. The final scene of the movie absolutely states in dialogue these two competing interpretations of how we can perceive the story, thus offering viewers the choice of which plot interpretation is real to them. We dream lots of silly things when we... No, NM. This was a real, truly live place. But adult viewers, most of us figure out very early in the story that the land of Oz is a dream. The funny montage of people and animals flying around in the hurricane makes it obvious. That's not just bad old school special effects. We've got people waving in a boat here. That is not bad special effects. That was a choice by the filmmakers to have that. And the nasty woman on the bike morphing into a wicked witch on a broomstick. This basically tells us signposts to us that the witch is simply a dream representation of the nasty Miss Gulch, the one who tried to take Dorothy's dog away. Now you don't need a psychology degree to figure out the basic meaning implications of these non-verbal details, and you don't need the filmmakers to verbally state in interviews that it's all a dream sequence, and that the Oz characters are basically psychological archetypes in Dorothy's mind. Given that this double narrative plot structure of the film is laid out in dialogue in the final scene and therefore can't be plausibly denied, other details in the film open themselves up to interpretation on that level. The filmmakers didn't have these four actors playing double roles in the story because they lacked the budget for more actors. 
or because they thought that the audience wouldn't recognize the actors in makeup, they gave them double roles because their look-alike equivalents in the Oz scenes are psychological archetypes from Dorothy's daily life. Each of the uncles speaks dialogue in the opening scenes that foreshadows what they will do, say, and represent in the Oz dream sequence. Now look at Dorothy, you ain't using your head about Miss Gulch. Think you didn't have any brains at all. Oh, I'm a failure because I haven't got a brain. She ain't nothing to be afraid of. Have a little courage, that's all. <laughs> I haven't any courage at all. The fact that Miss Gulch tries to take away Dorothy's dog to have him put down, and the Wicked Witch threatens to kill her dog too, and in both instances the dog makes a narrow escape, and each of the characters, Miss Gulch and the Witch, are accompanied by the same music. <laughs> These aren't examples of thoughtless script writing. They're not coincidental parallels accidentally placed there by the filmmakers. These parallels between Dorothy's waking life and her dream adventure are intentional. It's also not accidental that only the waking state opening and ending scenes are shot in black and white, or sepia actually given the brownish coloration, and the Oz scenes are filmed in glorious and vivid colour. They didn't run out of colour film stock. The filmmakers planned to shoot it in this way uh, as a way of visually distinguishing the two realities from each other. Some of this stuff is so basically obvious to us as adult viewers that a person of below average IQ could easily get the messages, but not all of it. The various foreshadowing innuendos in the dialogue of the uncles, for example, is easy to miss because it occurs so early in the film in some of the most uninteresting scenes. I mean, I'd never really taken much notice of their dialogue here until this recent viewing. And there are many more details linking the film's two realities together at the symbolic level that are easy to miss. Some of them you'll probably think, Oh damn, how did I miss that? And others will be more subjective and therefore might be mere projections on my part. Yes, it does happen. But that in itself certainly will not discredit the basic double narrative plot structure of the movie. Now don't worry, I'm not going to start claiming that The Wizard of Oz is an allegory of US economics and so on as some have claimed. I'm not saying that those interpretations are true or false. There have been all manner of interpretations of this movie flying about over the years. Some of them have been very interesting and some utterly stupid, like a claim that a midget actor hung himself on the set and can be seen in the background of one of the forest scenes. In fact, as far as I can tell, someone doctored the footage, then showed it blurred on YouTube to persuade the impressionable. But a quick look at the film in HD shows that the footage is different and there's just a big bird moving around in the background instead. So that's another weird dynamic to all this. You get people out there who actually post fake film analysis where they deliberately give stupid interpretations of things. Why they would want to do that is your guess. So keeping it real, to use a cliched and overused term, I'm going to whiz through some of the film and draw your attention to the details related to the basic double narrative plot structure. I'm not going to go into other alternate themes that could be explored. Just sticking with the basics. First up, the location Dorothy lives in is a dead-looking place. This is a studio set, so actually it's just as fake as ours, really. But check out the dead foliage, and particular, this big dead tree. This tree is undoubtedly significant in Dorothy's mind because it's got a tire on a rope hanging off it, which she probably swings about on. But over in the fantasy dreamland of Oz, the trees will be literally full of life and will bear fruit. Before going off to Oz, Dorothy sings Over the Rainbow, and while that can't be anything to do with the switch from dull sepia coloration of this footage to full colour later on, it can't be that, can it? When Dorothy runs away from home with her dog, she cautiously approaches this caravan, where she can hear a man singing in a very deep voice. <laughs> Well, 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 house guests, eh? <laughs> he comes out and slightly startles her, but turns out to be a really nice guy who actually talks in a more pleasant voice. This simple moment, which appears to be virtually nothing at this point in the story, is blown up into epic proportions when Dorothy and her psychological archetype companions approach the Wizard of Oz in his lair to ask for help. Oz's voice is also initially loud and scary. I want to go home. I am Oz. 
the great and powerful. But he will turn out to be a very nicely mannered guy with a pleasant voice hiding behind a facade of false magic, like this fella. I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. This guy will quiz Dorothy about who she is. And who might you be? And Oz will do the same in a much more dramatic fashion. Who are you? Who are you? Here he sits by a small fire cooking a hot dog. Then he lights a candle for his little bit of fortune telling. In turn, the mighty Oz hovers over clouds of belching fire and smoke. And you see that school-faced, deathly appearance of Oz? Well, step into this guy's little carnival caravan, and he's got a deathly skull placed above the entrance, and another one is facing them from the left as they come in. So in Dorothy's dream, he has been merged with the symbolism of the skulls. Some of these parallels are easy even for adults to miss, but now that you've seen them, do you really think the filmmakers didn't know what they were doing with these details? During the tornado scene, one of the first things we see floating about is an uprooted tree. No doubt this would be from Dorothy's farm, as are the chickens. Remember that the dead trees of her farm come to life in us. Now we get to the munchkin scene, and God, don't even get me started on this, there's so much going on here. But I will throw two possibilities your way out of interest. First, Dorothy comes from a desolate, lonely place where there doesn't seem to be any other kids. But this is like a holiday into kiddie party land. And second, being that most of the central characters in Oz are clearly representations of characters from Dorothy's waking life, maybe the munchkins and their straw-roofed huts, surrounded by oversized flowers and vegetation, Maybe those munchkins are surrealist manifestations of the small animals on Dorothy's farm. Now for the cynical film analysis denier types among you who will be suddenly rubbing your hands with glee and getting ready to write some sarcastic comment that I'm overanalyzing the movie, just let your eyes wander over this little bit of the scene. Did you see it? Did you see it? Munchkins hatching out of eggshells. And like Miss Gulch, the chickens were swept up into the tornado and thus seemed to have made the psychological port over to Oz. Next up, Dorothy comes across her uncle in scarecrow form. This location is a farm with shoddy picket fences, just like the farm she lives on. Except this farm has lush fields of corn instead of the desolate dirt from back home. And next up, Tin Man. Why a Tin Man? Well, there was a little reference in his introductory scene at the start of the movie about this particular uncle working with machinery. Hence, he's a tin man. Three shiftless farmhands that'll be out of a job before they know it. Well, Dorothy was walking along. I and... saw you tinkering with that contraption, Hickory. Now you and Hunt get back to that wagon. All right, Mrs. Gale. But someday they're going to erect a statue to me in this town. Well... All right, I'm trying to keep this video short so that I can get it edited quickly, so I'm not going to go over all the rest of the scenes of the movie. But I will say that regarding the personal traits that each of these new friends are looking for, brains, love and courage basically, the uncles had told her at the beginning that she needed some of those traits, and so her dream becomes about that. It's like her mind is divided into four separate entities journeying together. And, obvious to older kids and adults, these three new characters each reveal at several points that they already do have the traits that they think they lack. Scarecrow comes up with plans, even though he says he hasn't got a brain. Tim Man cries, and so on. In turn, this means that Dorothy discovers she already has those traits too. What they all needed, what she needed, was some external verification. She needed some adult authority figure to tell her that she has those traits and can use them. And I suppose you could say that being that this is all a dream sequence, it's basically her telling herself that she's got those traits. Something that Wizard of Oz has in spades and which seems common to a lot of the best family movies is that the filmmakers give little nudges and winks here and there to the adults in the audience, letting us all know that it's all just a child fantasy dream, but also letting us in on how clever the film is at playing into the non-verbal, deeply emotional and intensely dreamlike reality of young children. I, your wizard, Far Adua at Alta, am about to embark upon a hazardous and technically unexplainable journey. To that extent, I consider the film educational for adults too. 
It teaches us about subconscious archetypes and the fact that our everyday desires and anxieties do actually play out in our dreams, sometimes resulting in psychological progress. And as per the title of this video, Wizard of Oz indirectly reveals something that I doubt many adults ever consciously recognize. The deeply symbolic nature of this film and of the many details contained within it, this is not something that only exists in fiction stories and movies created for young kids. The movies that we like to watch as adults also operate on the level of symbolic dream logic. That's why we watch them in the first place. Like the kids who watch The Wizard of Oz, allowing its archetypes and symbols to play on their subconscious and to develop their perception, we adults also experience the same with the movies that we watch, the ones that aren't made for kids. But the difference is that it's less obvious to us. In some cases, movies that hold wide appeal and consistent rewatch value for adults do so because they are designed specifically to tap into our subconscious fears and anxieties and encourage us to process those feelings in new and interesting ways. Meanwhile, we consciously tell ourselves, it's just a movie. And just as a young child lacks the detailed understanding of reality and psychology to recognize how crazily unrealistic and psychologically potent their favorite movies are, we adults usually don't realize how filmmakers have engineered our favorite movies to deviate far from reality in order to tap into our dreamlike subconscious. I don't just mean genres like horror and science fiction, I also mean comedies, love stories, and just straight dramas. Like with the wizard here and his little bit of crystal ball fakery, which is positively designed to affect Dorothy's mind through the trickery and metaphor of fiction and thus persuade her to go back home where she'll be safe, Movies for adults do the same thing. They shroud their subconscious messages in an illusion of so-called realism, which in turn can make the stories even more subconsciously powerful. I like Wizard of Oz because, possibly more than any other movie I've seen, it absolutely demonstrates via the context of children how movies affect us in these complex subconscious ways. And in this video, I've only scratched the surface of the film's artistry. It's an 80-year-old movie, and it's still going strong. Okay, I'll stop there. If you're new to my work and you want to know more about the deep psychology of movies, then do subscribe and check out my other videos. To keep updated about my newest content, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. To support me in getting new material out regularly, consider supporting me with a monthly subscription on Patreon, or go and order and download some of my more in-depth offline videos from my website. I am planning more on The Wizard of Oz, by the way, so stay tuned. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Bye for now, folks.